They'll be discussing the Charleston three by three by three um, project and what it means for the citizens of the city of Charleston. Nancy, Wes, Mark, thank you for joining us today. The purpose of this webinar is to provide the public with an opportunity to hear directly from the Army Corps and the city about this project and its uh, implications for the future of our city, and also to give you a chance to ask questions. After our presenters uh, share remarks, we will have a Q&A session. This webinar is convened by Charleston Waterkeeper, the Coastal Conservation League, Groundswell Charleston, the Historic Charleston Foundation, Preservation Society of Charleston, and the Nature Conservancy. If you have questions for our panelists, you can uh, share your questions by typing them into the Q&A box that you should have available at the bottom of your screen. Um, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And if you are participating in this webinar by phone and you want to uh, submit a question, you can text that question to the following number, 843-790-3915. That's 843-790-3915. Text to that number. Okay, again, thank you very much for joining us. And with that, I'd like to hand it to Nancy Parrish with the Army Corps. Nancy. All righty, thank you, Laura, I appreciate that. And my name is Nancy Parrish, and I am the Chief of Planning with the Army Corps of Engineers here in Charleston. I'm gonna take a few minutes to um, give you a brief introduction to the Army Corps of Engineers planning process and then I'm going to hand it over to the project manager for um, this peninsula study to describe how we implemented this process for the Charleston Peninsula. So this first slide is just to illustrate that the Corps of Engineers planning process, which we refer to as smart planning, um, is also known as the three by three or three by three process, three by three by three, lots of threes in there. And it is just um, a reference to the course feasibility study delivery process that um, allows us three million dollars and three years to execute a feasibility study um, once Congress has authorized the study to be undertaken. Um, our three levels of vertical team engagement, that third three, starts here locally with our project delivery team, which includes our partners on this study, which is the city of Charleston, and Mark Wilbert is, uh, comes to our meetings regularly, and, and the city is considered to be part of our study team. We have our major subordinate command office in Atlanta, Georgia. They are our next level up in our leadership. They are responsible for the South Atlantic Division of the Army Corps of Engineers. And then, of course, we have our headquarters in Washington, D.C., and so we have to be integrated with all three of those levels. Um, this is a feasibility study, and it is just that. Congress tasks us with determining if there is a feasible solution to a specific problem that can be implemented within a specific area. So we are very constrained in what, as the Army Corps of Engineers, we're allowed to study. And in this case, we, are, we have been authorized to study the feasibility of reducing impacts from flooding from storm surge waters on the peninsula. So we go to the next slide, please. This slide um, illustrates the risk informed planning process. Um, the little graphic on the right hand side um, shows the planning steps in an iterative process. We kind of go round and round. It looks like it never ends over there, which is why I have the one on the left side that breaks out the six planning steps that we go through. This is uh, the process we go through for all feasibility studies nationwide within the Corps of Engineers, we have these six steps. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Wes will show you how we implemented these six steps for this particular feasibility study. So the first thing that we do, hopefully you can read those slides, uh, those little circles on the left, but the first thing we do is identify um, problems and opportunities within our project area and develop objectives for the study. 
And that way the entire study team is on the same page with understanding the goals of the study and the problems that we're trying to address with this feasibility study. We do an inventory, which is uh, basically assessing the existing conditions within our study area, which in this case is the, the peninsula itself. And then we forecast into the future what we think those conditions will be if we do not um, implement a project as a result of this study. So we are looking at, um, when we say existing conditions, we're looking at economic conditions, environmental conditions, what the water is doing today, what we think it will be doing um, 50 years in the future. And 50 years is as far into the future as we um, project our future without project or our no action alternative. We feel like beyond that, um, all the modeling gets a little too inexact to, um, to be reliable. So then we, um, we will brainstorm what we call measures, which are just uh, different ways that we could approach the problem that we've identified, this damages from storm surge, um, basically in this, in this particular area. Um, we look at a wide range of measures and we go through a couple of iterations of screening those measures based on various criteria as appropriate to the project and the study area. Um, we are looking for ways that we can you know, solve that problem and meet the objectives of the study. So we will look at a whole big wide range of, of ways we can approach a problem and then whittle that down as we go. And um, we combine those measures, which could be any, anything that we might construct into alternatives. We um, will compare those alternatives to that future without doing a project so that no action future is building something better than doing nothing at all. And it, in cases where we've determined that an alternative is better than doing nothing at all, we carry that one forward. If an alternative is not better than doing nothing, then we screen it out and we don't, uh, we don't look at it further. So with all of the um, array of alternatives that are better than doing nothing at all, we'll do a little bit more detailed analysis on those and then compare them to one another, looking for the one alternative that maximizes the um, net benefits we get in return for the federal dollars invested. And that is, um, it's a critical constraint on what we can select um, as the federal agency involved in this, in that we do need to maximize the benefits gained for the federal tax dollars that we spend, that we project spending on constructing a project. So, um, you know, throughout this project, throughout this whole process, there's a lot of assumptions going on, because we, like I said, we only have three years to do it all. So we, um, we have make assumptions, we, we list them, if you will, we, um, we put them in our report, our decision makers understand what assumptions we've made as we go through this process so that they can be informed on the decisions that, that they're making. If you go to the next slide, um, this slide illustrates that three year process that we have to get through all of those six steps and all of that decision making that we have to do, all of the alternatives analysis that, that we do. Um, the, we are currently um, just past that little number two there at, at about the middle of the slide. Um, we start with scoping and then alternatives development. We select a tentatively selected plan, which we did back in February. We had that milestone meeting. Um, we are currently in our public review process right now. Um, so we, we go through a concurrent review. We've got it out for the public, as you all know. We are also simultaneously doing um, an agency technical review where we get experts from within the Corps of Engineers, but outside of this region, to look at the work that we've done, to look at the models we've run, the assumptions we've made, and the conclusions we've drawn from all of that to see that what we're doing makes sense and follows our process correctly. 
In this case, we also have an independent external peer review where we have experts from outside the Corps of Engineers that is reviewing all of those same technical aspects of our work. Um, and simultaneously, we are going through a policy review to make sure that everything um, that we've done to date is policy compliant within um, the Corps of Engineers. So after this review period, going forward, um, in October, we anticipate having what we call the agency decision milestone, which is number three on this slide in the middle of the, of the picture. Um, it is at that point that we would disclose to our leadership the results of this review period that we are in right now. So we will discuss with our three levels of, um, of leadership the kinds of comments that we received, whether we got any input that makes us believe we have made a wrong decision or we have interpreted results incorrectly or that our assumptions were somehow so far off that it uh, influenced in a negative way the decisions that we've made. Um, and, and we will work that out with our leadership. Um, in my 17 years with the Corps of Engineers, I've not seen that actually happen where a, a study gets through a, a draft report and a, and a review period and finds that they've, they've literally just made the wrong selection altogether. Sometimes it needs to be tweaked a little bit and it needs to be adjusted. You know, that happens a lot. But for it to be completely wrong is, um, is fairly unusual. Not to say that I guess that it couldn't happen. Once we get past that decision milestone, which uh, we are currently scheduled to have in October, we will be doing, we actually have already started doing a lot more um, detailed work, but it's still feasibility level, a lot more detailed work on the design that we have. So we are doing some uh, additional modeling that Wes will talk about um, and some uh, looking at ways to optimize the plan that we've selected just to, to try and bring focus to it and, and get our level of detail um, more finely honed. So um, it still is feasibility level. I guess I just want to keep uh, emphasizing that, that at the end of this process, at the end of our three years, we have um, feasibility level designs, which are People like to talk about percent design complete, and it's something in the five to 10% design complete, you know, and uh, nowhere near uh, like a plans and specs level ready to construct kind of design. And um, that happens after feasibility is over. So um, we will submit our final report in May, I think, and then the last six months of our three years is consumed with our Washington level review, we call it. Um, and that is uh, some agency processing to get that report prepared for the chief of engineers to sign at the end of our three years. Um, one thing I'd also like to include is that built into this three-year process is um, our compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, or, or NEPA. Um, and some of you are probably familiar with that, um, that law and set of laws and other environmental compliance that we do. We do all of that during this feasibility process. And a lot of our six step planning process coincides with how the National Environmental Policy Act wants a federal agency to examine their impacts on natural and cultural resources. So it, it has to do with looking at no action, having uh, an array of alternatives that you're comparing the impacts to. So we're doing all of that at the same time. And this draft report that's out for review right now is uh, an integrated environmental assessment uh, with the feasibility report. So um, if I can, I would like to pass this off to uh, Mr. Wes Wilson. He is the project manager for this study specifically, and he can talk about how we implemented these six steps throughout the last year or 18 months um, in our three by three process. Okay, thanks, Nancy. All right, so now that you got the 30 second commercial for core planning, uh, we'll tie it into how it's related to the study. So very important project coordination. Uh, the city of Charleston is the non-federal sponsor and they are, all, are also our partners in the study. Um, so believe it or not, we, we developed uh, these alternatives and management measures with uh, many other agencies. 
Uh, we held two external scoping meetings in the fall of 2018, uh, where we made it through an iteration of that planning process that Nancy just uh, described. Uh, some of the stakeholders that attended this meeting include representatives from local colleges, medical districts, a &E firms, state and federal agencies, historic preservation organizations, and environmental organizations. I believe we had over 75 attendees at our second scoping meeting. We've also uh, held uh, multiple coordination meetings with CSX Railroad, Palmetto Rail. We met with the State Port Authority multiple times, DOT, and many others. Um, we've also developed an interagency coordination team made up of natural and cultural resource agencies. Uh, we meet with these folks uh, approximately every six months. Uh, again, we coordinated and held a public information workshop uh, January 31st, 2019. And this is the most important. And finally, the city of Charleston is included in all weekly meetings and they're considered a valuable team member in our project analysis and decision making. Next slide. So this is a coastal storm damage reduction study. So the main driver is coastal storm surge. However, secondary impacts are analyzed, and those secondary impacts are sea level rise and high tide. Sea level rise and high tide are included in the analysis and the modeling, but the main driver is coastal storm surge. So in our scoping meetings, we develop problems. So these problems were referred to in many, many times in our report and our analysis. Problem one, uh, reduce economic impacts. Um, problem two, reduce risk for potential for loss of life and declines in public health. And three, ac uh, access to critical infrastructures, emergency services and routes is limited or cut off entirely during coastal storm surge events on the peninsula. So these are very important as we go through and we start looking at our initial array of alternatives to see if these initial array of alternatives meet each of our problem statements. Next slide. So with that, we have some certain objectives uh, associated with our study. Our objectives are to reduce economic damages, which ties back to the problem statement, and reduce risk to human health and safety. Some of the constraints that we had identified, um, very costly constraints, that first bullet, uh, avoid modifications to I-26 and Highway 17. So that basically limits the height, the elevation of a potential storm surge wall. Um, and that, because you got to tie it into high ground, you, couldn't, you don't want to go over the highway, raise the highway, or modify the bridge at Highway 17. We wanted to minimize adverse effects to the historic districts and structures and minimize um, environmental uh, threatened endangered species and fish habitat. Uh, next slide. During the scoping meeting, uh, we identified 30 structural measures uh, that could be implemented during uh, our study. And these were not Corps of Engineers identifying, these were those 75 people from around uh, the Charleston area. Some of the things that we identified uh, are seawall berms, levees and dikes, cisterns, detention basins, a storm surge barrier, which is different than a storm surge wall. The storm surge barrier is essentially something that would connect uh, Sullivan's Island and Morris Island with a big barrier and a, a navigation passage gate. Reflecting seawall, wave attenuator, breakwater, road raising, and canal. Some of these structural measures were carried forward into an initial array of alternatives, and some of these uh, structural measures were screened uh, uh, due to their uh, uh, going back to the problem statement and to see if they were uh, uh, part of that problem statement. Uh, next slide. <coughs> um, Non-structural measures are also identified. Uh, some of these non-structural measures, the core has authority to implement and some we provide to the city of Charleston as a recommendation uh, that they can carry forward to implement. Uh, for example, 
items one and two, the Corps of Engineers doesn't have authority to uh, add rain gardens or bioretention planters. Uh, the Corps doesn't also have authority to do conservation easements. Uh, what we do have authority is something along the lines of 13 and 14, which would be to elevate structures and flood proof structures. Uh, next slide. So this is the initial array of alternatives. Um, after IDing the measures, we combined those measures into the initial array. I'll walk through the I'll walk through these briefly. Alternatives one, two, and three are essentially the same with with just the feature that's added in each. So for number one, a storm surge wall only. This was uh, this was screened because it left out areas outside the storm surge wall that were unprotected. Storm, uh, alternative two, storm surge wall and non-structural was carried forward into our final array for further analysis. Storm surge three, I'm mean, sorry, alternative three, storm surge wall, non-structural and wave attenuator were also carried forward uh, for further analysis. Alternative four was screened, non-structural only. This would still have, going back to the problem statement, we would still not have access to our critical infrastructure if we bought out or elevated flood proof all the structures in the 100 year flood plan. So it did not meet one of our problem statements. Uh, alternative five, uh, restoration of historic, historic creeks. Um, this is basically for drainage issues, so it would have a significant cost uh, with no benefits. Uh, six, parks and recreation. This one was also a screen. This is recessing high ground, uh, building canals. Um, canals do not stop storm surge, and this was more of a drainage uh, uh, solution than anything. Alternative seven, storage, very similar to alternative six. Um, this is more of a drainage uh, solution than, than stopping storm surge. Uh, next slide. So we walked these alternative plans and then we screened them on how well they met our planning objectives. And going back to our planning problem statement and objectives. And we also have four criteria from core guidance and the principles and guidelines. So we, we rate them on effectiveness, efficiency, and acceptability. And based on those ratings, alternatives two and three were carried into our final array of alternatives. Um, next slide. So we'll all talk a little bit about these two final alternatives. Alternative two is, consists of a storm surge wall modeled at elevation 12, non-structural measures, and we uh, place some conceptual pump, sta pump stations around the storm surge wall. Alternative three is essentially the same exact thing with the exception of a wave attenuation structure at the tip of the peninsula. And that wave attenuation structure is similar to a breakwater. Um, alternative three had the highest net benefits and which is our tentatively selected plan. So the tentatively selected plan is it has a total project cost of $1.7 billion. So when we take that math, based on the benefits on the peninsula, we have $14 billion in assets on the peninsula. Eight and a half billion dollars on structural assets, five and a half billion on content. So that's a total of about 14 billion. So based on our analysis and over a 50 year period, by implementing alternative three, we would reduce damages of $4.7 billion on the peninsula. So by our benefit number is 4.7 billion. That's the damages reduced over a 50 year period of analysis. Total project cost, total investment is 1.7 billion. So you, that, that is a pretty strong uh, benefit cost ratio, which the Corps of Engineers uses as they fund these types of projects. Um, so the uh, wall alignment, 
Uh, the wall alignment is very conceptual. As Nancy said, it's feasibility. We, are, we don't know what side of the street it's going on. We did, are determining a cost and a benefit. The wall elevation is also based on topography of the peninsula. So for instance, right now, the high battery wall is nine feet. Our proposed analysis is 12 feet. So we would be raising the high battery wall from nine to 12 feet. The hospital district, based on topography, the wall elevation will range between five and seven feet from the ground. So just because we say a 12 foot wall doesn't mean it's 12 foot around the peninsula. Morrison Avenue gets a little higher. Morrison Avenue, if we go up Morrison Avenue, we're looking at about a one to a three foot wall from the ground. Okay, so the wall alignment, very important. It, it's not 12 feet around the entire peninsula. It's based on topography. So we get a lot of questions about um, you know, impacts to surrounding communities. Uh, you know, one thing that we're doing in this optimization phase up until our, our final report is we're doing additional modeling and analysis over the next 12 months to see if we have any adverse impacts. If we determine adverse impacts, we will need appropriate mitigation in those areas. We cannot move forward with our recommended plan with, with our TSP without addressing any potential impacts. And we will have these results by our second comment period in early of 2021. So these will be available for public. Um, with that, I will, uh, I'll wait for a Q&A and I'll turn it over to Mr. Wilbert um, for the city of Charleston. Well, thank you, Wes. And before I get started, I wanted to um, thank all of the sponsors for today's webinar. This is really important to get this information out. And in this challenging times of COVID-19, uh, we certainly appreciate the partnership by all of these uh, sponsors to help us get it out. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And those sponsors have asked me uh, to address a number of items related to the city's goals, our current efforts, funding, Dutch Dialogues, Alignment, and the Future, and I hope I can do that today. Before I get started, I think it's important to say that although our focus today is on the perimeter protection study, it is only one part of a flooding strategy to deal with one part of the city. There are other strategies being used in other parts of the city to address flooding. Likewise, the focus of this study is the peninsula and protection from storm surge, where many other areas of the city, flooding from rainfall, may be the greatest threat. On the peninsula, the greatest threat is from storm surge. It is also the most costly and deadly of any kind of flooding. I want to just say that we're committed to the Army Corps' goals of protecting lives and property and preventing economic damages to the peninsula. Protecting lives will always be our first priority. But in addition to that, the city has its own set of priorities and goals that we will advocate for throughout the duration of the study and throughout the project. We must preserve the historic and cultural assets within our city. Through creative design and amenities, we will strive to maintain our historic connection to the water. We will ensure alignment with the principles and values found in the Dutch Dialogues report. We will preserve and maintain to the maximum extent possible our environment and the ecosystem it supports. And we must ensure that social equity and justice are considered and realized in the project's outcomes. Next slide, please. Our responsibilities so far have been to provide relevant uh, city-specific information to the team's engineers and planners and to assist them in developing the basis for the study. This has included similar city-sponsored studies and plans, engineering projects, approved future development plans, and identification of areas where we will want to take another look at alignment and wall design when we reach the preliminary engineering and design phase, or PED, after study approval and congressional funding. Next slide, please. Currently, we are working with the Corps of Engineers in the optimization phase. The goal of optimization, as uh, both Nancy and Wes have alluded to, is to develop a preliminary alignment of the barrier and develop a concept that is consistent with our goals 
and maximizes the federal cost share to the project. Although the exact and final design and location for the barrier will be decided in PED phase, the closer we can be in the study, more of the cost will be cost shared in project construction. And although it's, I think it's been mentioned before, I'd just like to repeat it again, this is a 65-35 cost share for construction, 65% federal, 35% uh, non-federal sponsor. And likewise, you heard Wes talk about non-structural options. We are working to explore, evaluate, and advocate for the best possible non-structural measures that can ensure the same level of protection as those areas within the wall, but also recognize and respect the character and uniqueness of the neighborhoods targeted for non-structural interventions. Recreational opportunities have generated a lot of questions so far. Citizens are rightly concerned about recreational opportunities and access to the water in those areas where the wall physically separates you from the water. We, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers, are strongly advocating for maximum recreational allowances at or above federal project dollars to ensure we maximize the multi-benefit approach of this investment. It has long been a goal of the city of Charleston to have a pathway along the water's edge that travels around the city and we intend to advocate for this wall being part of that solution. And then finally, public education. That's what we're engaged in today, is to ensure the public is aware of the project, knows where to go for information about the project, the timeline and method for submitting public comments is the primary focus of our work over these next two weeks. June 19th is that important date. That's the final date for submitting comments. We are planning to host inclusive design, study and outreach sessions led by our planning department and design center. Those will be in the future. And likewise, we hope in the future to be able to re-engage with our Dutch Dialogues team to the extent possible that we can in order to get their perspective and insight. Next slide, please. Now this slide here, this represents some of the more technical work that the city is facing over the next several years, and this will last all the way through construction. Once we, have signed, once we have a signed study, congressional authorization and appropriation, and an approved project start date, and actually an agreement with the Corps, the city will be responsible for all real estate, real estate work that needs to be accomplished in support of the project. This will occur in PED phase. There are many unknowns about the future of land development and usage that will need to be resolved much closer to project start date. Ideally, as the project start gets closer, we should be able to drill down on specifics and find opportunities to further optimize and perhaps even reduce costs. Likewise, operations and maintenance is a 100% city responsibility. As the wall and its associated gates are finished, responsibility for maintenance will be turned over to the city. We must also have a plan in place to open and close those gates as the storm approaches. We have started some preliminary work, visited New Orleans with our Army Corps of Engineer team to learn how things are done in New Orleans. And we will have a, although I think we'll have a much different organization, we will need to grow and train one to fit our city. And finally, we will need to ensure that as future stormwater projects are planned and finished, we must ensure there is total integration with the idea of a perimeter protection plan being in place and an understanding of what are the consequences of that on the total system's performance and requirements on the peninsula. Next slide, please. The next set of questions that we get is, uh, are there those on questions of funding? And those are very legitimate questions. Um, first, what will be the impact of this project on other projects throughout the city? This very quickly translate to, will the money for other projects be deserted for this project at their expense? So currently, there are two sources of funds that provide the majority of funding for stormwater projects off the peninsula. The drainage fund assessed through property tax and then stormwater fees. These two sources of funds are committed to operations and maintenance, as well as stormwater projects. Neither of these funds should be used to construct the wall. And I think it's important on that first set of bullets there under funding, you can see that it's a $600 million non-federal cost share to us in the city 
Um, and the way we're approaching that is we're looking at probably over five to 25 years of construction um, that will be uh, laid out over that many years. The next question we get is what could be used to fund this wall? So what are some potential, potential sources of funds? Well, certainly the general fund could be used and that would be used to service any debt utilized to support this project. TIF funds, tax incremental financing district funds could be used if the wall happens to be in a TIF district. Although currently most of our TIF funds are tied up in development agreements with minimal opportunities. And finally, tourism funds for certain portions uh, of the wall that are being built in tourism eligible areas. And that's the way we're currently funding the low battery uh, rehabilitation. All of this is dependent on recovering from COVID-19 and the impact it may have on our economy and future revenues. This ultimately leads us to looking for new sources of revenue, both within the city, the region, and the state. Options such as establishing a mid, a bid, a municipal improvement district, a business improvement district, public-private partnerships, et cetera. All of these avenues will be, need to be pursued, and we were just beginning to explore these when the COVID-19 pandemic struck. We do not need final answers to these before May of 2021, but we should have a sense of what are the possibilities given the unknown future that we're currently experiencing. And finally on this slide is a need to keep city council engaged to the maximum extent possible to ensure they have a full understanding of the study, its implications on the city now and in the future. Next slide, please. Another common question, and we hear this one a whole lot, and it's a very fair question and a legitimate question, is how does this wall fit with the Dutch Dialogue's recommendation? I think it's a fair question, as I said, and I would answer it by saying it's a good and necessary start. The Dutch Dialogue's team recommended as a long-term strategy, strategy for the peninsula, a no regrets polder approach. In order to have a polder, you must first have a perimeter protection system so that you can successfully control the water within the system. The work going forward is to ensure that we get the best wall that we possibly can and ensure that it is consistent with the city goals I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Ensure we get as many of our goals realized in the National Economic Development Plan and where that is not possible, we need to be prepared to spend city dollars to ensure we get the wall that is right for Charleston. The wall must, to some degree, do all of the things you see on this slide and more. And the final bullet here outlines the timeline or phase that we should be working on these various aspects of the Dutch approach to realize those goals and objectives. As you can see, some of this is occurring now in the study phase, some in optimization, and some will need to wait until PED phase to be fully realized. And I'll Though not on the slide, I think it's important again to mention that the peninsula is only one area within the city that the Dutch looked at and made recommendations. The recommendations for West Ashley and Johns Island are being addressed through other measures and other means consistent with those recommendations. Next slide, please. In the, two, the final two areas of concern that we've been fielding a lot of questions about are visual impacts and consequences to other parts of the city and region. The visual impacts of a wall around the city are a legitimate concern and are being addressed as part of an environmental assessment required by the study. Last week, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers established a Charleston Peninsula Visual Impacts Analysis Team to evaluate the visual impacts as a result of the wall. The team is made up of Army Corps experts, local historical group leaders, and city staff representatives. Their work will be reflected in the final study report but will also continue into PED phase. And likewise, a lot of legitimate questions and concerns about consequences of the wall and what will happen to the water that is pushed away. Where will it go? Great questions. These are questions I would expect to be asked, and the good news is the Army Corps will be modeling these questions in the next phase of modeling that will take place this fall. There should be answers by early 2021, we have told, been told that the Army must mitigate for any consequences the wall may cause, so I'm very eager, as are many, to see what the models tell us. Next slide, please. And finally, a little bit about critical dates going forward and what to expect. As Wes and Nancy, I think, both said, the public comment period uh, is, ends on June 19th. If you have a comment about this study, please use this opportunity to be heard. Jason has put up the uh, link 
at, at the beginning of this uh, uh, webinar, and I believe he's going to provide it all to you at the end. You can go to the Army Corps website, and there's lots of information about the study, um, the actual study itself, many visual tools to help you better understand what the tentative selective plan is proposing. Please comment as you desire and continue to track the progress as we go forward. A second public comment period for 30 days will occur sometime in early 2021. And I know we'll all be advertising that as we encourage you to remain engaged. The final report will be submitted in May of 2021 and the Chief's report should be signed in October and on its way to Washington, DC. And I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Christopher King for questions and thank all of you for your attention. Great, we we'll wanna thank everybody and uh, can everyone get hear me all right? Please give me a thumbs up if you can hear me on the panel, thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank everyone for your engagement. Uh, you know, our city is changing and we're either gonna grow by chance or by choice and that's why it's so critical that the community get engaged on decisions about the future of our city. Our groups work in the trenches every day and we really rely on y'all to keep us informed and the decision makers need to hear from you. And uh, there's no bigger project than we face in the problem of sea level rise. And so really wanna thank Nancy, Wes and Mark for uh, working with us today to answer some of these questions of which as you can imagine we've had lots. Um, there's no bigger project that we're looking at. So um, we've been inundated with questions since this, this went public. Um, and so I've also done my best. I've collected all the questions that have come in through the Q&A box as well as your email, and we'll do our very best to sort through them in the time that we have. Uh, and obviously um, we uh, can fully intend to follow up on any questions that we're unable to get to today. And I do wanna give a big thanks to Jason and Andy with the Conservation League for helping pull together um, a very technical presentation here. Uh, and so big thanks to them. So I'll do my best to direct the questions uh, and some I'll just gonna throw out there and let the three of y'all uh, fight over who gets to answer it. So, um, Mark, first question's for you. Um, the city's been working off the 1984 uh, drainage plan for decades. How does, that, uh, uh, how does that, this plan take into consideration that plan as well as the Dutch dialogues? How does this project fit within the overall city's approach to flooding and stormwater? And then it ended up by saying, you mentioned re-engagement with the Dutch dialogue team. Have they not been involved? Uh, in the early stages of planning? Well, let me answer the last part first. And the Dutch Dialogue team's been involved since the very beginning. In fact, I think one of the first uh, teams that we brought in when the Dutch Dialogues came in was the uh, Army Corps team that was working on this. And I think they met within the first couple of hours of the Dutch Dialogue team being here and they've remained engaged. In fact, we had a, uh, a little webinar within the city yesterday with some folks on the Dutch team members of the Dutch team were on board. So we've stayed in, engaged with them. Uh, in terms of formal uh, engagement with them, you know, uh, they'll be part of the team working on the comprehensive plan. So we hope to be able to have some of that engagement uh, carry on. Back to the 84 um, drainage study, uh, those projects are currently still ongoing. I think we're not even 50% 50 50 of the way through that. But if you look at it on the peninsula, there were a number of proposals. And as I said before, the Dutch recommendation is because of sea level rise, because of uh, how quickly that's occurring, that the peninsula will probably need to be in the future, uh, their strong recommendation is it need to be treated as a polder. Uh, part of the polder will be underground drainage, which is consistent with the projects in the 84 uh, master plan, but also uh, we have another contractor right now, AECOM, that's going through the city and kind of updating that 84 master plan. So all of that work will need to come together. It's a great question. Uh, we're working on it. Other parts of the city uh, have other strategies. We're not going to be able to build a wall, nor do we desire to build a wall around the entire city. So other strategies for other places. Great. All right. My next question is directed to Nancy and Wes. Uh, last year's Dutch Dialogues encouraged natural and nature-based features to be uh, incorporated for more resilience against all types of flooding. What sort of natural and nature-based features did y'all consider during your analysis and why were those ruled out? Nancy, do you want me to take that oh, one? Yes, yeah. sorry, I was yeah. on mute though and I'm oh. sure I could unmute myself. Um, yeah, okay, that's a good question. And we did look at natural and nature-based um, different kinds of measures that we could 
think about implementing. Um, we determined that they are incomplete solutions in that um, marsh or oyster reefs or uh, earthen barriers even are not going to hold back the storm surge level that we're looking at, right? We're looking at 12 feet of storm surge. And so by themselves, those kinds of measures are, they're not effective enough, right? So they, they don't solve our problem or, or meet our objective by themselves. So we didn't um, focus that as the main feature of our plan. However, we still have um, things like living shorelines and um, marsh layer, thin layer placements on the marsh as features within the, um, the overall plan that help support the, the structural measures that we are implementing. So we didn't throw them away. It's just that on their own, they, they couldn't address the problem. There was a sort of follow up to that, which was uh, who has authority to add bios, whales, et cetera? Um, yeah, I saw that question actually in, in the Q&A. And I mean, bios, whales are something that a lot of, of agencies and certainly the city could implement. It's a matter of um, how effective they would be and what, what you're implementing them to do. So, I mean, a bios, whale, again, it's not going to stop um, a large storm surge, which is what we're trying to address here, but it might, uh, you know, a swell like that might be useful for more of the raining interior drainage sort of flooding. So it, they can be implemented by others that just don't address the, the problems that we're looking at. Um, all right, Mark, this one looks like it's coming back at you sort of in the same line as the previous question, but more focused on the funding, I guess. How does this impact um, priorities and funding? Uh, we look at one to two billion uh, uh, in current need. How does this uh, affect in anticipated projects like Calhoun West and Church Creek? I mean, those, those are great questions. And, um, you know, as a city, we're going to have to recognize that our challenges are many and um, that each of the areas of the city are going to have to have their own solutions. As I think I said, uh, I hope I said well in my presentation, um, I have discussed with city officials and currently our thinking is that stormwater fees, drainage fund, probably not appropriate for this and we're going to have to look for other sources of revenue. Anytime you go to do a big infrastructure project, it's sources of revenue and we'll have to be creative about those uh, going forward. But we, we know that there's challenges with funding uh, specifically because we have all areas of the city to continue to address the sea level rise something and rain bombs are something that's challenging all areas of our city. Um, all right, an email question here. Um, why is the Corps pursuing an environmental assessment with a, uh, instead of the more thorough process of an environmental impact statement? How does the approach differ and uh, in terms of vetting and mitigation of potential impacts? Okay, um, that's a good question and, and one we have been asked. Um, the way the National Environmental Policy Act is set up, an agency begins with an environmental assessment. And if that assessment reveals that there are significant impacts to a, a particular resource, that will trigger the environmental impact um, the EIS process, environmental impact statement process, right? So it's just a, a bigger version of an EA. Um, in this case, for our um, particular study, we're starting with that environmental assessment. Right now, we feel like we have not triggered the um, significance threshold that the law uh, calls for to uh, trigger the EIS, the bigger package. However, what we've done with this EA, we're calling it a very robust EA. We've, we've been in consultation with Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fishery Service, and state agencies at CRM. As we have been working, I think Wes talked about our, um, our interagency team that we meet with you know, every six months and we've had a lot of input with them. Um, helping us to determine when and if we reach that significant threshold. Right now, um, we are 
looking at impacts to the marsh, you know, the wetland marsh area. Oh my gosh. Cat. <laughs> and, uh, and we are working during this optimization period to reduce those impacts. So we want to start by avoiding impacts um, and by pulling, for example, the wall out of the water, which will reduce those impacts. So that's the first thing we're doing. The difference between um, EA and EIS is that significant threshold. Under an EA, we may still have impacts and we would mitigate for those in the same way we would if we're developing an EIS. So we're still um, required to mitigate for, um, for those impacts either way. We're just not doing the, the bigger, it's not even a lot much bigger process. Usually the biggest difference is that you do a 45 day public review instead of a 30 day public review. And here we've done 60 days. So we've, we've exceeded both. Great. Um, let's see. Um, what work has specifically been done to engage the Rosemont and Bridgeview communities? And have plans for those areas become more clear since public engagement began? I can, I can take that one. Um, thanks, Chris. Uh, we had a site visit um, with the Bridgeview to determine first floor elevations of that community. Um, it was important to get the first floor elevations to see what kind of non-structural measures we could implement um, in the Bridgeview area. Uh, and just to keep in mind that what, what Mark said, these non-structural areas, Bridgeview, Rosemont, and Lowndes Point, are, we're providing the same level of protection uh, with these non-structural measures as areas inside the wall. Uh, there are some constructability issues uh, with the, the by placing a wall around Bridgeview uh, due to the cemetery mar and existing marsh and wetlands. And then Rosemont, by extending the wall up along that perimeter of I-26, uh, is a very, very expensive and it's, it's mu much less expensive to implement some non-structural measures. So, so Bridgeview, we have, we have, we're working with the city to determine these. Um, more than likely, it'll be some flood proofing measures. Uh, we'll have a more defined uh, analysis and, and report at our second public review um, in early 2021. And then for Rosemont, we did a windshield survey to determine, um, to look at different structures to see if any could be flood proofed and raised or raised. And we would have, we'll have that analysis complete uh, for our second public review. And, and Wes, there was a lot of questions about the Gadsden Grove Park area, but it, it applies to, to all areas outside of the wall. Um, you know, how is accessibility considered when the wall closes, if people live outside of the wall, um, whether it's in Gadsden Borough or Rosemont, how do people get into the city at that point? Right, so they'll, obviously there'll be gates. Um, scattered around the wall, you know, pedestrian gates, vehicle gates, uh, road gates, and the areas, you know, the areas that are outside of the wall are not included because they have, and uh, the base elevation, the first floor elevation is higher than our proposed storm surge wall elevation. So by having that base elevation higher than our 12 foot NAVD 88 wall, it will do nothing to reduce the risk of damage during the storm event. And we will work with the city in design phase to define operation and maintenance of these gates. Uh, we don't have a process yet. However, the city will be uh, taking control of the operation and maintenance of these gates, opening and closing prior to a storm event. And do y'all have an initial estimate for the maintenance and operating costs of the wall over the next 50 years? Uh, yeah, so uh, right now we're, we're on the high end. Uh, so the range when it when we get the final report will be between three and five million dollars per year great well i apologize i'm getting the hook uh over text here uh, as we only have until five o'clock i know we have a lot of unanswered questions uh, i've got about two pages of questions so what we will do is work to gather these up um, and work with our speakers uh, to work on getting answers that that our organizations can follow back up on and hopes to get everyone's questions answered. Thank you all. Okay, um, thank you, Christopher, and thanks to Nancy, Wes, Mark, uh, for all this great information. We appreciate your uh, willingness to reach out 
to the public and, and help people understand this complex project. Uh, my name is Winslow Hasty. I'm the president and CEO of Historic Charleston Foundation, and we're um, excited to be a, a co-sponsor of this event today. Um, and by the looks of the number of participants, there's certainly a, 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 a big appetite for learning more about this. So we're, we're super glad that people were able to engage through this webinar. Um, I just want to remind you all the, the slide that's in front of you, obviously um, urging you to submit your comments by the end of this public review period, um, public comment period rather, which does end uh, June 19th. So the, um, th that end date is coming up soon next week. So please do um, submit your comments. You can do it online at the, the website that's on the slide there. So um, we really do, this is a very important time for the community to sort of put stakes in the ground and, and uh, assert their uh, opinions and thoughts about this project. Um, while there are gonna be future optimization and design phases, uh, this is really uh, the time for the community to, um, to articulate concerns. Uh, you might have potential opportunities to improve this. Um, storm surge protection barrier system. Um, as everybody said, this is a huge infrastructure project for the city. And, you know, given that it's in uh, a, a nationally, internationally recognized historic district, it has increased complexity in terms of making sure that it's appropriate and compatible with the historic district and the character, unique character of, of Charleston. So um, we've got a lot of work in front of us. Um, I do want to thank all the other co-sponsors, again, just to remind you, the Coastal Conservation League, um, the Preservation Society of Charleston, Charleston Waterkeeper, Groundswell, as well as uh, the Nature Conservancy. So um, I do want to urge you all the, that all those groups included with Historic Charleston Foundation, you know, there's a lot of um, expertise and resources that you can tap into through these organizations. So we would urge you to go to individual websites. Um, I'm fairly certain, certainly Historic Charleston does. I'm sure the other organizations have resources on their websites regarding the, this three by three study. So urge you to, to, um, to do your research and due diligence. And certainly if you have any questions of our collective organizations, feel, please feel free to reach out as well. Um, and then just quickly, I want to, uh, assure you that even beyond this public comment period, um, all of our uh, nonprofit organizations are going to be engaged throughout this process. Um, Historic Charleston will be involved in the Section 106 Environmental Review along with the Preservation Society and the city. And so we will be working with, as Mark mentioned, the, the visual analysis to understand the impacts, the visual impacts in particular of this uh, piece of infrastructure. and we will develop uh, mitigation uh, measures to make sure that, that we can avoid any adverse impacts. So we will be working hard on that. And then um, as has been mentioned, you know, there is going to be an additional comment period in early 2021 after this project has gone through some additional optimization. And so we are looking forward to being able to have yet another opportunity to engage with the public and have the public provide feedback a little further along in this process. So um, don't, don't, uh, don't fear that this is your last chance, but again, this is a very important chance to um, get your voice heard and have it recorded and considered through the Army Corps process. So um, again, thanks to everybody. And um, I think we amazingly, it is 4.59 and I think we have, um, hit this on the mark and met our goals. So um, thank you again to everybody for participating and for all the speakers and have a great day.